Neither runner has retouched his base. So the pitcher throws to first base to appeal that the runner on first did not retouch. That makes the third out. But the runner from third scored on that play. That would not be to the advantage of the offense. So they can now make a fourth out appeal and appeal that the runner from third did not retouch and take that out, which would prevent the run from scoring. Now we're going to go indoors where I can show you some things on a chalkboard and diagram some situations to show you how an appeal play can affect whether or not runs score. It's a very complicated process, so we're going to need to do some chalkboard work. So let's go inside. Now we're going to talk about when the umpire indicates to the scorekeeper when a run scores or not, when a third out is made to end the inning. A run is scored when anybody touches first, second, third, and home. But there are some exceptions. No run can be scored if the third out is made on a play where the batter is put out before he reaches first base or if a result of a play is a force out. There's some confusion about what force outs are and we're going to go through all these plays right now and some examples of when you would score a run and when you wouldn't. All right, there's four types of plays. There's a timing play, force play, the batter out before he reaches first, and appeal plays that can make the, the last out. A timing play is simply if the run, runner touched the plate before the third out was made and the out was not a force. In that case, the run scores. If the third out is made before he touches the plate, then obviously he can't score. Okay. A force play, it doesn't matter what time he touches the plate. If the third out is a force out, that run does not count. The time that he touched the plate is, is irrelevant. If the batter is out before he reaches first base or touches first base, no runs can score. And it doesn't matter when that happens. He could be out on an appeal play or he could be out on a regular play. Run, two runs could score before he is put out. But if he's out before he reaches first, those runs are not going to count. An appeal play could result in a run not scoring. And we're going to deal with the rules that are involved with that. An appeal play could be a force out, in which case if it's a force out when the appeal is made, then no runs would score. We're going to give you some examples here to try to cover all of this because it can get very confusing. In this first example, it's going to be a real simple case of a timing play where the run scores either before or after the actual out is made. So if we look at the board here, we have runners on first and third, and we have two outs. And this runner is attempting to steal second base. The catcher throws down, and as he throws down, this guy tries to score. Now, this is a timing play, because there's no force out involved. So it's simply a case of if this runner touches home plate before this runner is tagged out, then the run would count. If the runner is tagged out before this runner touches the plate, then his run doesn't count. Very Simple example of a timing play. Which happened first, the out or the score? Now we're going to have an example where there's two outs and the batter hits the ball and he's a pretty slow runner and the runner on third gets a good jump and he touches the plate before the batter is put out. But that is not going to score a run because no run can score if the batter is put out before he reaches first. A lot of people think that's a force play, and it's technically not. It's similar to a force play, but it's simply if the batter is put out before he reaches first base, no runs can score. So if this guy hits a ground ball, he starts running, this guy comes in, crosses the plate, then the throw comes, they get him out. Even though he scored before the out, this run would not score because no run can score if the third out is a result of the batter being put out before he reaches first base. Now we're going to give an example where the run doesn't score because the third out was a result of a force play. In this situation we have two outs, runners on first and third, and the play is going to be that this runner gets a good jump and takes off as the batter hits the ball, ground ball to the shortstop, throws to second base. This runner touches home plate 
before this force out at second. Even though he touched the plate before this out, in this case it's not a timing play, this runner was forced to advance. If the third out is the result of a force play, no run can score. So in this play, this run does not count. Now that we've established that the third out can be the result of either a timing play, a force play, or the batter out before he reaches first, we get into the complicated situations where there could be an appeal play and the result of that appeal could be any one of those three things. And you have to decide which one it is before you can decide if the run scores or not. So we're going to have an example here of an appeal play that is also a timing play. And the runner is on second and third base with two outs. And in this situation, the batter gets a hit, so he reaches first. And on the play, the runner from third scores. The runner from second comes around third, and he fails to touch third. So that's an appealable situation. Comes in and scores. Now the defense appeals that this runner failed to touch third. That makes the third out. Well, the appeal was made as a timing play because he was not forced to that base. So at the time of the out, the appeal, one run had already scored. So you would score the runner from third, but not the other runner, and the inning would end. Now in this example, it's the same situation as the last play. We have runners on second and third with two outs, and the batter gets a hit. And on the hit, both runners come around and score, only this time, it's the lead runner from third who fails to touch home. This runner does touch third and touches home. Now the defense appeals that he failed to touch home. That's the third out and it's a timing play. And although the timing of the appeal was after the runner from second scored, there's an exception to the rule, rule 7.12, which says that if the third out is made as a result of an appeal, no following runner can score. So the runner from second, even though he scored at a time after the appeal was made, there's a special rule that says he does not score. In this situation, we're going to have a third out appeal, which also results in a force out. And if the third out is a force out, no runs can score, even though it was an appeal play. So we have bases loaded with two outs and the batter hits a double, but the runner from first fails to touch second. So he hits the ball, the runner from third scores, the runner from second comes around and scores, the runner from first fails to touch second base as he goes to third, and the batter winds up here. So at the end of the play, we have runners at second and third. Now the defense appeals that this runner failed to touch second base. Well, he was forced to second base. So that out on appeal is a force out appeal. So these two runs would not count. Now in this example, we have an appeal play that's a result of the batter being put out on appeal before he touches first base. So no runs can score. This is a wonderful play here. The bases are loaded with two outs and slugger here hits a home run over the fence. This run comes in, this run comes in, this run comes in, but he, in his excitement, fails to touch first base. Everybody's congratulating each other over here and the defense appeals that he missed first base. That means he was out before he touched first base and no run can score if the third out is made before the batter reaches first base. So none of these runs would score and the inning is over. Now we're going to deal with the situation where there's runners on first and third with only one out. And there's a lot of confusion on this play. People think that it's a force out, in which case runs would not count. This is not a force out play. I'll cover it here for you. There's runners on first and third with one out. The batter hits a fly ball. So this runner gets ready to tag up. This runner goes part way. Now the ball is caught for the second out. 
This runner legally retouches, comes in, and scores. Now the throw from the outfield goes back over to first, and it reaches first base before this runner gets there. Now that's a continuous action appeal. And if, if he's called out, that's not a force out, it's an appeal out. And if that out occurs after this runner touches the plate, the run would score. If that out occurs before he touches the plate, it would not score. It's a timing play, not a force play. This is a continuous action appeal. All right, that covers all the situations. Let's head back out to the field. Rule 708, any runner is out when, B, he intentionally interferes with a thrown ball or hinders a fielder attempting to make a play on a batted ball. A runner who is judged to have hindered a fielder who is attempting to make a play on a batted ball is out whether it was intentional or not. A runner must avoid a fielder attempting to field a batted ball. The fielder is protected from being interfered with the moment the ball is hit toward him and the umpire judges that he's the one who can field the ball. The runner must avoid him wherever that fielder needs to go to field the ball. The runner has no right of way. The runner is out if he interferes whether it was intentional or not. The fielder is protected from the time he attempts to field the ball up until he releases the throw. If the ball gets away from him and it's within a step and a reach, he's still protected from being interfered with. If the ball gets further away and he has to chase it, then he would not be protected and no interference would be called unless it was intentional. Interference by a base coach can be done with a batted ball or with thrown ball. There's two rules that apply to the base coach. Rule 7.11, which says any member of the offensive team must vacate any space necessary to avoid a fielder attempting to make a play. Rule 3.15 deals with coaches and any incidental contact that they may make with a thrown ball or a fielder. In this play, a batted ball is attempted to be fielded and there's interference by the base coach. He must avoid a fielder attempting to field a batted ball and he must vacate any space necessary. And on a batted ball, if interference occurs, the batter would be out and the ball's dead. Now on a thrown ball, if the ball accidentally hits coach nothing is called unless he intentionally kicks the ball away from a fielder or if the fielder bumps into the coach and the coach is not doing anything intentional there would be no interference on a thrown ball or a loose ball 509 the ball becomes dead and runners advance one base or return to their bases without liability to be put out when f a fair ball touches a runner or an umpire on fair territory before it touches an infielder, including the pitcher, or touches an umpire before it has passed an infielder other than the pitcher. If a fair ball touches an umpire working in the infield after it has bounded past or over the pitcher, it is a dead ball. If a batted ball is deflected by a fielder in fair territory and hits a runner or an umpire while still in flight and then caught by an infielder, it shall not be a catch but the ball shall remain in play. If a ball goes through or by an infielder and touches a runner immediately back of him or touches the runner after being deflected by an infielder, the ball is in play and the umpire shall not declare the runner out. In making such decision, the umpire must be convinced that the ball passed through or by the infielder and that no other infielder had the chance to make a play on the ball. Runners advance if forced. This situation is one of the most difficult ones to understand. There's three different rules that say similar statements. All three rules are very complicated, poorly worded, and it's very difficult to understand. So we're going to try to simplify it here by showing three different examples. The fundamental principle is, is that the runner is supposed to avoid a fielder attempting to field a batted ball, and he's supposed to avoid the batted ball itself. If he's hit by the batted ball, he's out in almost all circumstances. There are a couple of exceptions, and we'll go through those with these examples. This first example is the easiest call to make. The runner must avoid the batted ball. 
If he's touched by the bat of ball before it passes through or by or is touched by a fielder, he's out. In this case, the fielders were playing back at normal depth and he was hit by the batted ball. You call time, that's interference, the runner's out. In this example, both fielders are playing in and the runner is touched by the batted ball. Although the ball has passed by the fielders, he's still out. This is not the exception to the rule because the ball did not pass through or by the fielders. Through or by means within their reach or through their legs. So in this play, the runner is still out. The important thing to remember is that the runner is out when hit by a batted ball with only one exception, and that's if the ball goes through or by a fielder and touches the runner immediately back of that fielder. If that doesn't occur, the runner is out. So it's important to understand how professional umpires interpret through or by. Through or by means if the ball goes between the fielder's legs or within his reach, as in this example, it goes underneath his glove, and the ball then hits the runner immediately back of that fielder. If those conditions are met, the runner would be safe. But then there's an exception to that rule. He again would be out if, as you can see in this picture, another fielder has a chance to make a play on the ball. So in this play, the runner is out because the ball went through or by the first baseman, but the second baseman still had a play on the ball. Rule 2.0 an infield fly is a fair fly ball, not including a line drive nor an attempted bunt, which can be caught by an infielder with ordinary effort when first and second or first, second, and third bases are occupied before two are out. The pitcher, catcher, and any outfielder who stations himself in the infield on the play shall be considered infielders for the purpose of this rule. When it seems apparent that a batted ball will be an infield fly, the umpire shall immediately declare infield fly for the benefit of the runners. If the ball is near the baselines, the umpire shall declare infield fly if fair. The ball is alive and runners may advance at the risk of the ball being caught or retouch and advance after the ball is touched. The same as on any fly ball. If the hit becomes a foul ball, it is treated the same as any foul. Okay, now we're going to talk about the infield fly rule and how it's judged. We're going to show you some situations that are and are not infield flies, even though the ball is popped up in the infield. It's a judgment call based on the ability of the player to catch it with ordinary effort. In this example, although the ball is popped up in the infield, the judgment is made as to whether the infielder could catch the ball with ordinary effort. In this play, the fielder is running full speed and still can't get to the ball. Therefore, it is not an infield fly. The ball would be live and you would play the play. In this play, the ball is popped up in the infield and although the fielder has to move a little bit, it would still be judged as ordinary effort and this would be a declared infield fly. The batter is out. In this example, the fielder is unable to get underneath the ball so this would probably not be judged as an infield fly. It has to be ordinary effort. In this example, the fielder catches the ball on the outfield grass, but it's still an infield fly because he was able to catch the ball with ordinary effort. The judgment is based upon the effort by the fielder, not where he is when he catches the ball. Rule 2.00 Interference Offensive interference is an act by the team at bat which interferes with, obstructs, impedes, hinders, or confuses any fielder attempting to make a play. If the umpire declares the batter, batter runner, or a runner out for interference, all other runners shall return to the last base that was in the judgment of the umpire legally touched at the time of the interference unless otherwise provided by these rules. Rule 7.08b, any runner is out when he intentionally interferes with a thrown ball. Interference with a thrown ball is a general category. It means intentional interference with the thrown ball when it's in flight, or it can be with the fielder's attempt to throw the ball, or it can be with the fielder's attempt to catch a thrown ball. The thing to remember is to call an out for interference, it must be intentional, which means the runner must do something other than simply try 
to get to the base safely. If he's trying to get to the base, which is your judgment, and some collision occurs, there's no penalty. If in your judgment he did something other than trying to get to the base to interfere with the fielder's play, then there would be a penalty. Also, he's not out just because he tries to interfere. There must be an actual hindrance of the attempted play. On this play, the runner clearly slides at the fielder and interferes with his attempt to make the throw. This could be judged as intentional interference since he didn't slide to the base. Since he was already out before the interference occurred, the batter runner would be out for his teammate's interference. As soon as you judge that interference was occurred, you call time, that's interference, and the batter runner is out. All other runners would have to return to the base held at the time of the interference. You do not wait to see if the play completes. You make the call when you judge that interference occurred. On this play, the runner tries to hinder the fielder, but he's so late getting there that the throw is already completed without any hindrance. So even though he tried to interfere, there's no penalty here. He didn't interfere with the play. There is no must slide rule in baseball. The fact that this runner comes into the base standing up is not interference. He was just trying to get to the base and did nothing else other than run to the base. On this play, the runner comes into the base standing up which is not interference by itself, but he also raises his arms and intentionally swats at the glove. That is intentional interference, and you would call the batter out. 7.05. Each runner, including the batter runner, may, without liability to be put out, advance G. Two bases when, with no spectators on the playing field, a thrown ball goes into the stands or into a bench whether or not the ball rebounds into the field, or over or under or through a field fence, or on a slanting part of the screen above the backstop, or remains in the meshes of a wire screen protecting spectators. The ball is dead. When such wild throw is the first play by an infielder, the umpire in awarding such bases shall be governed by the position of the runners at the time the ball was pitched. In all other cases, the umpire shall be governed by the position of the runners at the time the wild throw was made. Approved ruling. If all runners, including the batter runner, have advanced at least one base when an infielder makes a wild throw on the first play after the pitch, the award shall be governed by the position of the runners when the wild throw was made. To simplify this rule, you just have to remember that when a fielder throws the ball out of play, all runners are awarded two bases. The question is, Sometimes they are awarded two bases from the time of the pitch, and other times they are awarded two bases from where they were at the time of the throw. The time of the throw is when the ball leaves the thrower's hand, not when the ball goes out of play. When the throw that goes out of play is the first play by an infielder after he fields the batted ball, all runners are awarded two bases from where they were at the time of the pitch. The time of the pitch is when the pitcher makes his motion to deliver the ball to the batter. In this play, the shortstop fields the ground ball and his first play is to throw to first. That resulted in the ball going out of play, so the batter is awarded two bases from where he was at the time of the pitch, which was home, so he gets second base. All other runners would get two bases from where they were at the time of the pitch. When the throw that goes out of play is the second play by an infielder or a throw from any outfielder, the award is two bases from where the runners were at the time of the throw, which is when the throw leaves the thrower's hand. In this play, the first play is the shortstop's throw to the second baseman. The second play is the second baseman's throw to first. So now the award will be from the time the ball left the second baseman's hand. As you can see, both runners have reached their base before the second baseman releases the ball. Therefore, the runners are awarded two bases from the time of the throw. The lead runner will be awarded home, the batter runner will be awarded third. In this play, the throw that goes out of play is the second play by an infielder, but the runner has not reached the base at the time of the release of the throw. So he will get first base and second base. In this play, the throw that goes out of play is the second play by the infielder. 
So the award is from the time of the release of the throw. As you can see, when the throw is released, the batter runner has already passed first base. Therefore, he's awarded third base. Normally, when the throw that goes out of play is the first play by an infielder, the award is two bases from the time of the pitch, but there's an exception to that rule. If the batter runner and all runners have advanced at least one base prior to the throw, the award becomes from the time of the release of the throw. In this play, you can see that the fielder has bobbled the ball and he threw the ball even though the batter had already reached first. So the batter would get third. Rule 7.05, each runner, including the batter runner, may without liability to be put out, advance, F, two bases if a fair ball bounces or is deflected into the stands outside the first or third base foul lines, or if it goes through or under a field fence, or through or under a scoreboard, or through or under shrubbery or vines on the fence, or if it sticks in such fence, scoreboard, shrubbery, or vines. This play is what is typically called a ground rule double. It's when a fair batted ball goes out of play. The batter and all runners are awarded two bases from the time of the pitch. A ball is in flight until it touches something other than a fielder. If it is only touched by fielders, it is still in flight. This is a ball that is in flight.